Thank you very much. Uh, I'd just like to thank the organizing committee as also the chairs for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Phil Pucher. I'm a surgical resident uh, based mostly at Imperial College in London, but we tend to move around a bit, so this is some data I'm presenting from uh, Dorset County and Poole Hospital, two hospitals in the south of England. Uh, and we're looking at learning curves and outcomes for proctored adoption of ventral mesh rectopexy. Uh oh. Is that, uh, oh, we got, ah. Thank you very much. We've got a solution. Uh, I have no disclosures. Perfect. So for um, those of you who might not be familiar with it, uh, laparoscopic ventral mesh rectopexy has been around for about 20 years and uh, in recent years has really been uh, gaining further and further uptake and based on the literature out there now is really the preferred option for treatment of rectal prolapse, rectal intersusception and uh, symptoms of obstructive defecation. In keeping with those symptoms, the patient cohorts tend to be uh, slightly more elderly females uh, it is a technically complex procedure involving, as it does, deep pelvic dissection, uh, retroperitoneal, retroperitoneal placement of a mesh, and laparoscopic suturing. And it does, therefore, also have potential for serious complications, despite being surgery for benign conditions. So those include uh, mesh erosion, mesh infection, and uh, the poten potential for rectovaginal fistulae, among others. As such, uh, it's of course important that if we are performing uh, such complex surgery with potential for serious complications in a largely elderly and therefore slightly more higher risk cohort, that we really do need to know uh, what is the learning curve and what are the risks of adopting this procedure, even this in the setting of an experienced laparoscopic colorectal surgeon. Uh, this is sort of your classic learning curve as we all tend to think about it and as you'll often see them illustrated. We all know that there's a starting point. The outcome metric can be post-operative outcomes or is more frequently looked at in terms of operati operating times. We've got the slope, which uh, represents the adoption phase or the learning phase. And then eventually, of course, the plateau phase, which is perhaps a little bit of a misnomer because as you can see and as we know, uh, it never really plateaus into a horizontal line. It merely approximates a very slow increase in skill over probably years rather than the steep learning curve at the beginning. In terms of appreciating what learning curves mean, another way of looking at them is to the use of cumulative sum curves or Q-sum curves. Now this is uh, a formulaic way of looking at learning curves uh, and the exact formula you can see there. Basically the upshot of Q-sum curves is what it does is takes the differences between a given outcome for a given case uh, the difference between that and the mean of the outcomes for all preceding cases. So for example, in terms of operating time. In terms of this practical application, what this means is as you reach that plateau and as you've reached that sort of slowing of your improvement, what you'll see is an inflection point in the graph and that's what you're looking at in terms of the Q-sum curves. So what I've got here is the only other previous publication uh, looking at learning curves for ventral mesh rectopexy and is really what we were comparing our data against. The difference here is that this is a singular data set for a single self-taught surgeon and we are looking at the uh, appreciation of skill or the learning curves in the context of proctored or mentored adoption, which is really the main difference in, in how the two surgeons in this cohort really adopted this procedure. So as I say, the aims for this study, to look at learning curves in a proctored setting, and also evaluate the overall safety adopting ventral mesh rectopexy in this manner. Two surgeons from two different centers, both experienced, fully trained laparoscopic uh, colorectal surgeons. They adopted the procedure simultaneously, and they were proctored by the same expert in mesh rectopexy. So this included joint lists, video coaching, and sort of standard didactics over a period of several months. We looked at data from prospectively maintained anonymized databases, and we subjected them to QSUM and comparative analyses. So just looking at the demographics basic, uh, briefly here, you can see we had just over 300 patients, 311 in total, and uh, they were roughly equally distributed between the two surgeons. There was no difference in demographics, looking at race, uh, gender, age, or ASA grade, and morbidity overall was just over 3%, um, with no differences between the two surgeons there. Uh, there was a significant difference in terms of operating time, which I'll come back to briefly at the end. Uh, suffice to say, we weren't able to identify a completely obvious cause. Uh, it didn't seem reasonable that one surgeon was taking an hour longer than the other. We thought it probably had more to do with how it was being documented in different centers, uh, but I think that's secondary to the conclusions of this study, which I'll come back to. 
length of stay was the same. Looking at the QSUM curves, so operating time, uh, despite the overall difference we found, the significance here that we're looking at in terms of the initial inflection point, so that point at which we're saying expertise or certainly advanced proficiency is being achieved, was 29 and 34 cases for the two surgeons. And again, I compare that to uh, the approximately uh, 60 or 70 cases that's been cited in the previous literature that we're looking at comparing to. In terms of outcomes, looking at length of stay, again, the inflection point was much earlier, 24, 26 cases, with much more similar curves here. If we look at morbidity, uh, this curve, so whenever you see this sort of mountainous up and down and up and down, what that actually suggests is that there's no appreciable learning curve at all. So if there was a learning curve, so if we're saying that the initial cases were more at risk of post-operative complications, you would expect to see that curve with an inflection point and then going down as we've seen with the other curves. The fact that this just goes up and down and up and down suggests that actually this is just a, um, uh, well, th that you're going to every now and then have some complications, but that there doesn't seem to be an appreciable pattern to it. <coughs> Pardon me. Based on the difference in operating times and also the slight difference in curves that you could see in the previous slide, we then also just looked at patient selection to see whether or not that was perhaps accounting for some of it. And it suggests that it probably is. Uh, if you look at the differences in patient age, uh, the main differences in the slopes here, just to mention in terms of uh, understanding the QSUM curves, is that the importance is actually the slope. So if you look at the initial slope of the darker line, it suggests that that surgeon was having much, uh, much more careful selection, so much younger selection, and therefore the contrast to his later patient selection was much greater. The other thing to note here is that actually there isn't a particular inflection point for either of these curves. They both continue to slowly increase, which is, again, what you might expect as you grow in experience and grow in confidence that you're maybe pushing the boat out a little bit more and slightly older uh, patients on average are being increasingly more selected. So what does this tell us in the, uh, on the whole? Well, we've been able to show that for two different surgeons adopting practice in two different centers, that the learning curves, regardless of the outcomes you're looking at or the endpoints you're looking at, are remarkably similar, so between 25 and 30 cases. And that in this mentored or proctored setting, that this learning curve is much decreased from the 60 to 80 cases that have been previously cited in existing literature. Certainly, this mentored adoption is what's currently being uh, recommended by a recently published international consensus guideline specifically for mesh rectopexy, which says that really any adoption of this sort of case has to be done in this sort of mentored setting. And with the numbers that we're demonstrating today, it does suggest that we can say now that perhaps 25 to 30 cases should be the minimum duration for that coaching or mentoring period whenever someone is starting to uh, or looking to adopt this procedure from scratch, even if they are previously experienced. Thank you very much, and I welcome any questions.